My name is Conrad Carroll. I'm the youth director here at Antelope Road Christian Fellowship, and we have the pleasure of uh, taking over the main service on Youth Sunday. Um, so youth band gets to play. Um, they make the foolish decision of handing me the microphone, but here we are, and you're stuck with me. Um, and I'm really excited because we are going to uh, finish off the series that we have been in um, called Saints and Sinners. Um, I, they, they gave me the, the final leg of, of the series, part eight. So I'm excited to finish this out with you. Um, God has really just been speaking some cool things to me that, like, I've heard this story before, but it's just really illuminating some new things. So I'm hoping um, that, that God will speak to you through it and, and that there'll be a message in here for you. Um, and that's, that's not just a hope. Like, there is a message here for you. It might not be from my mouth, so just listen to the Holy Spirit. He's probably got something for you that's different than what I'm going to say, too. Um, but, so, but, but to that end, I just want to pray before we dive into the text um, that God would, would speak to us. So let's, let's pray together. Lord God, I just want to pause because I feel like I, it's easy for me to get all riled up and and uh, and rambunctious, God. I, I I just desire that that Your Word would go forth, God. And I know that that only happens by Your Spirit. So, God, we are asking that that by Your Spirit, Lord, You would speak to us through Your Word, God. You would illuminate the text, God, that we would be able to see You um, in in this story. We would be able to um, see the truth of who Your Son Jesus is. God, would You um, just lead us closer to your heart today. And God, I just want to ask that you would help to get me out of the way so that your word can go forth today. God, open our hearts to hear what you have to say. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to be reading um, in... Well, I decided to name this this message, uh, Two Long Walks. Um, because we're reading in John chapter 4 verses 43 uh, through 54, and we're going to see that there's a lot of journeying going on. So if you want to turn there, also if you uh, do not have a Bible, we might have a volunteer who would be able to um, go and hand Bibles. So if you don't have a Bible, would you raise your hand and we can deliver one to you. Um, and if you're using that Bible, it's on page 884. Um, if you're using your own Bible, Maybe it's 884? Probably not. I don't know. Um, you'll have to figure that one out on your own. But So we're going to read this text, verses 43 through 54. And I've got a few comments that I want to stop as we're reading, so pardon me if I interrupt the, the flow. Um, also, like, I want to encourage you to, to read, this, read this on your own, too. Because um, I'm going to interrupt it and throw in all of my thoughts, but a lot of times the text just speaks for itself. Um, if, uh, um, if we just read it and we read it out loud. Um, so, uh, we, we are about to jump right in, but the problem is that it starts out with a sentence that, say, at, uh, that says, at the end of, these, of the two days, Jesus went on to Galilee. So then we have to ask, what was that two days? And that throws us into this whole context to say, where is Jesus coming from? Um, he has been down in Jerusalem. Oh, in fact, do I have that map up there? Yes! Ah, I didn't have this during the first service, so you get a special treat. Um, this is ancient Israel, or what is called the ancient Near East. Um, if you haven't looked into the geography of the ancient world, it's fascinating. And really, understanding this map, at least this area, all these highlighted lighted areas, understanding that area um, really helps to make the Bible come alive. Because all of a sudden, when they start listing off locations, you can look them up and you can see, oh my gosh, that really, that's not, that's not that short of a walk. Um, it, it starts to, to make some sense. One thing that's really interesting is we're about to, uh, we're looking at, uh, the story just before this was the woman at the well, which is a Samaritan woman. So Jesus was down in Jerusalem, which is in Judea, that, that orange section down there, and the underlined uh, capital there is Jerusalem. Um, that's where he was at. Everyone made their pilgrimage down to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. So everyone was down there. Um, but Jesus is actually from Galilee, up at the top. 
and all these other areas um, didn't get along with Samaria. It was like Samaria versus everyone. Um, they, they had differing opinions on theology. They were, the Samaritans were viewed as like kind of these half-breeds, not really fully Jewish. And so, so some people would, when they're leaving Galilee, instead of going through Samaria, they would journey all the way around through Decapolis, through Perea, into Judea. Like they would, they went to some crazy lengths to avoid Samaria. They would cross a lake and two rivers just so they wouldn't have to be in this country of people they disagreed with. So that's, that's an interesting side note. But Jesus is down in Jerusalem and he is journeying back from Jerusalem up to Cana, which is in Galilee in the yellow section at the top. So he has, he's in Judea at Jerusalem and he has to go through Samaria to get to Galilee that's this journey that we're on. This kind of, this kind of map, it really, it really does help to, to illuminate and just to see so that when you, I don't know, when, when you hear a bunch of names of towns and you don't know the names, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but if, if I'm talking to you, a modern day, day American, and I say, oh yeah, I took a drive, uh, you know, down to Elk Grove. You guys are like, oh, okay. You went from Citrus Heights to Elk Grove. That's great. It's very different if I say I went from uh, Citrus Heights to Los Angeles. Like, it, it, it's, you know it immediately. Um, and so the original readers of this text, when they would list off these names, they would know it immediately. But for us, we got to do a little bit of research to see what it was like. Um, so, we, so we've got this long journey. That's about 80 miles from Jerusalem up to Cana. Um, and... Uh, so just before the story, Jesus had stopped right in the middle in Samaria in that town called Sychar, is where, is where Jesus was at the well with this woman. So he had stopped just maybe about halfway through his journey. Um, and he had been there, and he, this, this woman saw that Jesus was the Messiah, and she went and told everyone, she said, could this be the Messiah? And they came and they saw him, and they agreed, and they said, it is no longer for your testimony that we believe, but we have seen it for ourselves. And they're so excited that they asked Jesus to stay with him, to stay with them at that town for two days, which is pretty unheard of that Samari the, the Sumerian quote unquote half breeds would, would be willing to welcome in Jewish men to stay, not just Jesus, but all of his disciples stayed there too. Um, to stay an additional two days in a village that would normally be hostile to them, all of a sudden they, they found this peace and they inv invited him. Um, so that's where we're coming from, is they had, he had just stayed two days um, in, in Samaria, and we'll see that he's going to make his way back up. So let's uh, look at the text again here. Uh, so it says, at the end of the two days, Jesus went on to Galilee, from Sychar to Galilee. He himself had said that a prophet is not honored in his hometown, yet the Galileans welcomed him, for they had been in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration and had seen everything he did there. So what this is saying, Jesus grew up in Nazareth, so he's from Galilee, and he's saying that, like, he, he's made this statement a couple of times that people... Uh, from his hometown won't honor him as a, as a prophet because he'll be speaking these words of God and they'll, he'll be like, wait, is that, isn't that Mary and Joseph's son? Isn't he a carpenter? How is he going to have the word of God? He's supposed to be working with wood and nails. How, how is he going to try to speak into my life and give me these spiritual challenges and things like that? Um, so he's, so normally if he goes to Nazareth, like people don't believe, but in this situation, a lot of people had been in Jerusalem with him for the, the Passover feast, and they had seen the work that he had done there. And so as he's coming back, it's almost like he's got these advocates with him who, who are like, oh no, like, Jesus is really legit. Like, we, we, are, um, we're, we, we see the truth of who he is. We understand that he's powerful. We understand that he's a prophet. Um, even though he's so much more, they at least knew he was a prophet. So we've got this weird tension where there are some people who have seen who he is and they, they accept him, but also there are some people who, to them, this is just Mary's boy. This is just Joseph's son. Um, so how could he possibly ever speak um, with the voice of God? Um, so 
That's where we are. Yeah, the Galileans welcomed him, for they had been in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration and had seen everything he did there. Now, 46. As he traveled through Galilee, he came to Cana, where he had turned the water into wine. Just a little pause. We're going to refer back to that old story of the wedding at Cana, where they turned the water into wine. Um, that's what this is asking you to remember. It's asking you really to notice the similarities between water are between the water into wine and here the healing of the sun. And also, that might be the reason why this royal official we're about to meet, it might be the reason why he even knows who Jesus is, because he turned the water into wine at the wedding at Cana. All right, we're in 46. So there was a go government official in nearby Capernaum whose son was very sick. Sick, 47. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son who was about to die. Um, so now we can see Capernaum just up at the top of the Sea of Galilee. It's, yeah, right underneath Chorazin and above Magdala. So, so that's, that's not as far as a journey as from Jerusalem to Cana, but it's still 18 miles. Still 18 miles. So he had just come 18 miles to Cana because he heard that Jesus had made the long trip from Jerusalem up to Cana. So he's, so he's pleading with Jesus, please heal my son because he's about to die. And then verse 48, Jesus asked, will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? The official pleaded, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. Then Jesus told him, go back home, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. While the man was on his way, some of his servants met him with the news that his son was alive and well. He asked them when the boy had begun to get better, and they replied, Yesterday afternoon at one o'clock his fever suddenly disappeared. Then the father realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him, Your son will live. And he and his entire household believed this was the second miraculous sign that Jesus did in Galilee after coming from Judea. So, the map helps a lot, but, but he had just come from Capernaum to Cana, and as soon as he comes to Cana, Jesus is telling him to turn around and go back. He's just walked 18 miles, now he's got to walk 18 miles back? That's why I wanted to title, title the sermon, Two Long Walks. Because how frustrating would that be to show up after a long journey, only to after what we have in this account as a short conversation, the short conversation to say, no, no, just go back home. Like, I walked all this way to talk to you for 30 seconds and then go home. So I can only imagine that's kind of frustrating in our long walk back. Um, a couple things that, that are really important. This, this is not the main point, but it's important context. Um, oh, sorry, will you uh, go back over to the slides? Yeah, Passover is John's way of saying that someone's about to make a big decision about the identity of Jesus. They're, they're about to, to figure out really what they believe. They're going to make a statement. Um, and I had heard this before, and, and, I, and I, even, I had studied it um, back when I was uh, preaching on John chapter 2. And, and I remember studying this and, and just kind of saying, like, oh, that's cool. John is using this little literary device to help us know if he brings up the Passover, all of a sudden he's going to be talking about people making decisions for Jesus. Um, and I think that's kind of cool that, that he's, he's got this, this, this mindset as he's writing to, to tie these, these um, situations together. Um, but then I was really dwelling on it as, as, we, as I was preparing for this message, and I was, it just, I was struck with, with why. Why would he use Passover as a symbol for people making decisions for Jesus. And so it made me think, well, what is Passover? And Passover takes us back to Exodus 12, where the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt, and God uses Moses and these ten plagues to uh, convince Pharaoh to let, to let my people go. And if you've seen uh, the Prince of Egypt or the old um, Charleston... Char yeah, yeah. I, I never saw that one. I'm sorry. 
I was questioning whether I was actually a Christian when I was thinking about that. I haven't seen the original Ten Commandments. Oh no. Um, but if you guys have seen those movies, it's really easy to get a picture of this, this really dramatic scene of like, we're going to do this plague, set us free. Okay, wait, never mind. And then just this big cycle over and over again until this biggest tenth plague, which is um, that the firstborn in every household is going to die. Um, and that's, that's terrifying. But at first, Pharaoh still isn't convinced. And so, so God's going to go through with it. He's going to send this angel of death through the land of Egypt to kill the firstborn son in every home. Except he makes a way out. He makes a way out for, for the Jews. He gives them this, this order of events to follow. He gives them this prescription. He says, okay, so to make sure that the angel of death does not enter your household, but instead passes over, um, kill a lamb, a year old, a perfect spotless lamb, kill it and uh, you're going to cook it and eat it, but before you do, use some branches as a brush and dip it in the blood and paint the blood over um, the, the doorpost of your house. And then the angel of, of death will see the blood and it will pass over. That's why they call it the Passover. Um, and they celebrated the Passover um, with, with a meal that they comm commemorated where where they, they, they ate the meal, they, they still eat the meal just like they ate it that day, um, which was with your belt tied, with your sandals on, you're ready to go, staff in hand, and you're eating it quickly because you're going to eat this meal, and then you know that Pharaoh's about to be really mad and send you out of Egypt. Um, but the whole Passover was, was a statement that said that the blood of this lamb is enough to cover over the in the inevitable death that is coming to my household without a doubt the death is coming but the blood of the lamb will will allow the spirit to pass over instead so for some of you the wheels are already turning and you're like whoa that's really cool and i agree with you it is but just to go the full way like jesus is this new lamb who his blood covers, atones, the death that we are going to, without a doubt, encounter. Is anyone here planning on avoiding death? I don't know. I don't think, I don't think we can. It's, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Um, but we have this hope in resurrection that, that the blood of Jesus will allow this, this death. He's the only one who has conquered sin and death. And if we will allow his sacrifice to count for us, if we will allow that blood to be over our do doorpost, then, then we'll be saved and we'll be saved. Um, and so the Passover is a decision about is the blood going to count for me? And that's the same thing that, that people in, in, in these stories are encountering. It's the same decision they're encountering. So when John said, when he brings up the Passover, all of these Jews who are reading this or all of these ancient Near Easterns who are reading this, they know about the Passover. They know about um, that the whole story that went on and they're they're making that connection that like oh yeah it's just like the Passover it's just like choosing for that blood to count for me too and it's the same decision that this official this royal official is going to come to it's, he's going to be faced with it he's going to be stuck to say is it does the blood count for me or does it not does the blood count for me or does it not so that's not the main point but it's important to be aware of that also, this is not the main point of the message, but it is the main focus of this entire series that we've been in. It's called Saints and Sinners. Um, so this was, Pastor Greg set this up for John chapter 3 and John chapter 4. In John chapter 3, we saw Nicodemus, who was the religious elite, like one of the smartest guy. He's like today, he would be like a Bible scholar, a professor, a pastor of a mega church, whatever. Like he's, he's a super religious dude who knows a lot of stuff. And he meets up with Jesus at night because he's heard about him. And he's kind of like scared. <laughs> he's kind of nervous because like, I've heard a lot of stuff. Um, and it might be true, but I need to know for sure. And if I go and I ask you in broad daylight, then all of my friends will know that I'm talking to you, which could be very controversial. So let me go at night, sneak up and say, hey, what's this whole deal? And Jesus kind of like says like, okay, you asked all the lame questions. Let me give you the answers to the really important ones uh, instead. 
So there's that scenario where, where, where the religious elite come to Jesus. And then we have the other story about the woman at the well. Who the woman at the well was this Samaritan sort of quote-unquote half-breed that, that did not belong in the family of God. They, there was mixed blood between Jews and Assyrians. And, and even beyond that, she had had a checkered past with having five husbands, and then the man that she's with right now is not even her husband. So, so she is as far as far can be from, from this religious stuff that's going on. But Jesus comes to her. He's on his way to Galilee, right? But it's just, it's, it's no coincidence. It's not an accident. He goes and he sits at that well and he waits and he sends all of his disciples away so that he could have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with this woman. It's just not an accident. And she sees him as the Messiah. So Jesus comes to the people who are so far away from from organized religion that that they wouldn't even feel welcome he goes to them the, the religious elite come to him he goes to the religious outcasts and then here we have our story that's a little bit somewhere in between so this story that we're reading is not the same story as the Roman centurion slave they have a lot of similarities but this isn't the same one the Roman centurion slave like this is a that's a Roman dude who uh, he comes to Jesus and he says, I know that you are a miracle working man and I trust that if you say that my s slave will be healed, he will be healed. And Jesus is like, whoa, I haven't seen faith like this even among the Jews. And a Roman is saying, like, you, you could heal him if you just said it. But this story, this guy is a royal official, which means he's probably a Jew. Um, because royal officials were from the region, they, you know, you have to be in the bloodline, you have to be in, in that network, but it, it's also a system that was set up uh, by the Roman government. So by having this job, he's pretty much committing treason against his people, much like the tax collectors, where, yes, sure, they're Jewish, but they're also, like, working, you know, they're kind of, like, in cahoots with the Roman government, so all of their Jewish family and friends are just like, what the heck? You're a sellout. I can't believe you would go to the government for money when they are oppressing us and like stifling us. Um, so this guy has pretty much become estranged from the Jewish um, people because of his occupation. And so even though he is a Jew, he's kind of like the scummy kind of Jew that people wouldn't really be super excited um, to have him around. Um, so he's kind of somewhere in between, where he's, yeah, he's kind of in the family, but he's also like a little bit of an outsider. And then it's also somewhere in between because Jesus made the long journey, so it's almost like Jesus is coming to him, and then it's also like he's made the 18-mile journey, so is he coming to Jesus? Like, I don't know, it's pretty much right in the middle. Jesus has made a journey, this man's made a journey, he's kind of an outcast, kind of a part of the family. But whatever it is, he came because he had hope that Jesus could do something. He believed that Jesus could do something. And this is the main point of this message. That optimism can get you to Jesus, can get you to the cross, but only faith can get you on your own cross. What I mean by that is, this man had all the hope in the world that Jesus could heal his son. And, and it's interesting to think about it. Like, I wonder, I wonder what measures he had taken already. I'm trying to imagine a father who has a sick son, what measure would they take to ensure that their son could be made well? I imagine that, that he's already tried every exhaustible option. He's already sought out every single solution. And here, he probably has heard about this miracle worker because of the water into wine thing at the wedding at Cana. And he's like, yeah, that guy, he performed that parlor trick that one time. I wonder maybe if he could heal my son. So I feel like he's kind of out of options here. But optimistically, hopefully, 
he makes an 18 mile journey from Capernaum to Cana. Which is still like a long, a long walk, at least as far as I'm concerned. He makes this long journey in hope. But when he comes to plead with Jesus, it says he begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son who was about to die. He's saying, I've only ever heard of miracles working when the healer is there. Jesus, come with me. Come with me from Cana all the way to Capernaum so you can see my son so that you could touch him and he'd be made well. Do that. Do that thing. But Jesus looks, pierces right through him. Just looks past all of that and he says, Will you never believe in me unless you see wondrous miracles and signs? He, he, he totally pushes to the side this whole illness, the whole son situation, even the whole journey. He just looks right into his heart and he says, about you and me, about you and me, will you not believe me unless you see the miracles? And the man says, Jesus, please, just heal. Come with me before my little son dies. And I love the, I love the parallel here. The officer says, come before my boy dies. And Jesus says, go, for your son will live. The exact opposite retort. He's, he's like, go, because he will be healed. But here's the thing. He has to go in faith. He got, has to go in faith because who knows, like, I, I, I can only imagine a, 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 a healer, like, touching someone to make them well. But here he is saying that he's well already? That he's well right now? That, I don't know about you, but I don't know that I would be satisfied with that. If I have walked 18 miles to come to the healer, and he says, go, I'd be like, No. You come with me. What I'm asking is that you would go with me. Is there time in your schedule? Can you and your posse, can you all follow? This is really important. I think it's really important. I, I don't think I would be satisfied with that. It takes faith. It takes faith to walk away from Jesus to go do what he says. It takes faith to follow his command, his command that says go. For those of you linguistic people, it's the imperative. He's saying go. It, it's a command. And faith is not the same thing as optimism. Faith is not the same thing as hope. True faith is only revealed by obedience. True faith stirs us up to act upon the word. Optimism is not a salvation option. You will not be saved by optimism. Don't get me wrong. I actually think optimism is great, and I'm rather optimistic myself. And I think a lot of joy can be brought from optimism. I really, I really do. I think the world would be a much brighter and happier place if more people were optimistic more of the time. Um, but it would also be a lot more delusional. It'd be a lot more delusional of a place because there's this hope that I have that something's going to happen, and I've got, I don't really have any evidence to base it on. I'm just saying, like, well, who knows? Maybe the best will happen. And that's really nice, but it's not the truth. The truth is not always as happy as optimism is. It's not always as nice and neat and well-packaged as hope. But the truth is better. The truth is always better. Because I would rather have the truth than a happy delusion. I would rather live in reality than live in some fantasy. Even though the fantasy is nice, I'm just, it's an escape. I'd rather know the truth and walk in that and allow that to be my foundation. And it's faith that would put us on our own cross. That verse, Luke 14, 27 says, unless someone would take up their own cross they are not worthy to be my disciple. Those are the words of Jesus. He says, unless you would be willing to take up your own cross, to bear your own cross. And that's before he's even crucified. He's making references to his crucifixion before it happens. 
And he says, unless you do that, unless you would be willing to let all of your previous hopes and, and dreams, unless you would let those die, then you can't experience the fullness of life. Now don't get me wrong, Jesus wants to give you hope, but he doesn't want you to come to him hoping for something else. We're going to close with some questions and, and, and a time to reflect on them. And, um, I, it's, it's harsh. The, the questions are harsh. Um, or maybe I'm just too gentle. But, but I have a question. If, if you're a Christian, have, have I been coming to Jesus for hope? Or have I been coming to Jesus for Jesus? Because if I've been coming to Jesus wanting him to fix my problems, then I'm much like this man. I'm much like this man where I've got a problem and it's really important and you need to fix it right now. And Jesus looks at me and says, will you not believe me unless I do these things? It's almost like he's saying, am I just your spiritual puppet that you, you expect me to do whatever you ask, that every string you pull is what I'm going to do? Am I coming to Jesus for hope, for optimism, asking him to change something in my life, to make something better for me? Or am I coming to Jesus for Jesus? Am I coming to him for his presence and allowing his miraculous salvation to take place? Because salvation is the greatest hope that we have. So if I come to Jesus for Jesus, I will receive hope, but it has to be just for him, for nothing else. It can't be anything else. If I come to Jesus for something other than Jesus, then I'm worshiping something that is not Jesus. If I come to Jesus because I need money, then money is my God. If I come to Jesus because I need healing, then health is my God. And I worship those things. But if I come to Jesus for Jesus, then Jesus is my God. And Jesus is my God. If you may come into Jesus for hope or for Jesus. And if you're still figuring it out, then if you're still thinking about it, is Jesus real? Is this whole thing legit? Or is it, is it crazy? The question I want you to consider is, am I okay with faith and trust towards the one who is calling me to die to myself. The very one who says, you're not worthy to be my disciple unless you would take up your own cross, unless you would crucify all your previous expectations and you would come to me with an open heart. Am I okay with faith and trust towards that one? Because that's scary. It's scary to say, I'm going to come to you with everything. In fact, I'm going to come to you with basically myself died. I, I, I am ready for you to give me life. I don't want the life that I had before. I want you to give me new life. That's scary. That's scary. And it doesn't seem very optimistic. It doesn't seem very hopeful to say, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of all of my hopes and dreams and expectations. That sounds very depressing. But there's something that Jesus wants to give us instead of what we're holding on to. And it only works if we'd be willing to let go. He can only give us something if we let go of what we're already holding on to. So I want to encourage you to think on these questions. I'm, I'm going to invite our, our elders and our prayer counselors to, to stand. And, and they'll be around the, the sanctuary. And if you have something that's on your heart, I want to encourage you to... to to deal with it now. This is something I actually, I tell the youth group all the time that, that if God is bubbling up, if, if God is working in your heart and something is bubbling up to the surface, face it now. Face it now because the other option is to allow it to simmer back down and to push it back down. And if you do that, it'll be back next week. It'll be back next month. So I just want to encourage you to, to face it now. Jesus is trying to get through, trying to say something specific to you. I want to encourage you, whether it's in your seat, alone, quietly, whether it's leaning over to the person who brought you and, and praying with them, or whether it's coming up to, 
to one of our elders or prayer counselors. Um, we want to encourage you um, to seek Jesus in this time. Reflect on these questions. And I'll come up in a few minutes and close this out. love us enough to invite us into your family, God, that you would invite us to receive adoption as sons and daughters into the family of God, Lord, that we could all be counted as part of one big, very dysfunctional family called the body of Christ, God, that you would allow us that freedom to be called your children, Lord. I pray right now that you would drive us to your presence more often, God, that we would say your name, that we would encounter you, that we would read your word, Lord, that we would be beacons, ambassadors of your love, God, that we would be lights into the, into our communities, God, that we would be, that we would be people who represent you so well, that when people encounter us, they have an opportunity to encounter your presence because we take it with us. Lord, would you, would you help us? Would you give us the right words to speak? Would you give us the motivation to reach out to the people you're calling us to reach out to, God? Would you help us to settle the problems that are inside of our own hearts, the struggles, the wrestlings that we have? God, would you help us to find the solution? Would you help us to find the answer, God? And would you allow that answer to be your very presence, God? Would you allow the answer to be the truth? And Jesus, you say, I am the way the truth and the life. God, allow your very presence to answer every prayer that we have, God. We love you, Lord, and we ask all of these things for your glory, God, because we want your name to be, be made great in Citrus Heights and in our homes. God, we love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for having been with us. Maybe enjoy a lunch invite someone out to lunch or, or enjoy an afternoon of football or whatever it is that you do.